you know, just, a- uh, just saving the world. No big deal. Oh. <laughs> just hanging out with my boy Spider Man. This is like oh, the wait, first man. time that I think any of like the current GDA administration has has actually like met with you as like a, as our advisor. I guess like we've we yeah, okay. I think that's so cool. That's so cool. I mean, I mean, we're not here for like advising, obviously. It's just it's really cool to to see. Right. This. Yeah. Well, good. 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 Good to uh, good to see all you guys. Uh, how's everything going? How's life? How's the semester? Operating systems all nighter last night. What about you, Nathan? <laughs> I actually had a pretty good, pretty good rest last night. I uh, I finally am over like the hill from like the exams and projects that were last week. So hopefully this week is a uh, a bit more rest and relax. Good, good, good. Solid, solid. Don't. How about how about, how about, uh, how about you, Mister Fox? Uh, you said you weren't in Gainesville right now. Where are you right now? Uh, so I don't live in Gainesville. Uh, I live. Uh, my wife and I live outside of Orlando. And so uh, I am rarely in Gainesville, um, just for class pretty much. And then, uh, uh, which this semester is really only two days a week. Uh, I'm there on Wednesdays and Tuesdays, or Wednesdays and Thursdays rather. Um, And then uh, going forward, um, I've recently transitioned to another role at the university where I'll be teaching online classes exclusively uh, and helping coordinate uh, with the UF online program and the computer science department as sort of the liaison between those two organizations, those two departments within the university. So uh, it's it's a benefit for me where I don't have to be in Gainesville because I don't live in Gainesville. Uh, Not that there's anything wrong with, you know, Gainesville or uh, <laughs> or whatever else, but uh, it's just not in the cards for uh, my wife and I to move there. So, for the last couple of years, I've been commuting, and uh, that's not a short commute. So, uh, you know, it's uh, it's a for me, it's a win win. Um, I know some students have expressed a sadness that I won't be uh, on campus really uh, much anymore, but uh, you know, it's, it works out for me. So. I was uh, I was helping another student with a, a programming two project, and she was talking about how like you and Professor Resch co-teach fundamentals two. Right. Yeah. So uh, Professor Resch is um, she's teaching classes on Mondays and Fridays, and then I have the Wednesday session. And sometimes uh, I might do um, I might do something remotely if you know there's a day she can't make it or if there's a day that uh, you know I do uh, like live coding demos and things like that um, then I might do some of those on a Monday or a Friday still remotely but um, you know that's uh, uh, just a, the way we've had it work out which you know most of the time you don't have multiple instructors in a single course but uh, the alternative was uh, you know in my new position to just kind of cut and run and be like all right well somebody teaches it I don't really care and uh you know i i don't feel right to doing that so i didn't uh and and then here we are makes sense makes sense that's cool i mean there's always uh when it comes to you know it comes to to filling uh you know staffing needs at a university uh depending on you know what the time of year is or or you know just the number of people in a department can sometimes be a challenge to get enough people to teach all the spots um i've been fortunate in that uh you know i teach the same courses uh, every semester um or at least the same kind of stable of courses across the course of a year but that's not always how it is somebody might go on vacation or uh you know they want to do some new class it's like well in order to do this new class, I have to stop doing this old one, which means somebody else has to step up and fill that in, or we cancel a class or something like that. And for core courses like uh, like a programming two or or you know any of those uh, really critical courses, we can't do that because uh, uh, you know for hopefully obvious reasons. And uh, and so you know sometimes we have to figure out how to make it work, even if it's a little unusual or less than ideal or whatever else. Um, but you know we make it work. And I think having having different perspectives, having different um, different teachers with different styles, uh, different backgrounds. Uh, you know, I might give examples with with things like uh, you know video games or something like that because I find that fun and, and entertaining and whatever else. And I know some students do as well. Uh, but I know for a fact some students have not enjoyed that and uh, have have said as much in course evaluations and things the, like that. The uh, video game examples. Yeah, I've, they don't I've, like video game examples to teach coaching. Nope. Uh, I, I how, how is that uh, like what is the what is the grounds of that like video games are like <laughs> the, the peak of like object oriented you know it's like so easy it's it's like the least abstract 
Yeah, uh, I mean, it could be could be someone who has no interest in that level of programming. Uh, maybe maybe they're more interested in doing systems design, or you know, they really want to code in C or assembly or something like that. And so you know, to them, video games is ah, that's just frivolous stuff. Ah, whatever. I want to do real computing or I don't uh, know. Uh, 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 go back to building my website. <laughs> right, right, right. Uh, but I mean. But let's not knock somebody who wants to build operating systems or, or compilers or whatever else, because uh, I certainly don't want to. And uh, <laughs> I greatly appreciate those people who do, uh, because the world needs those people. Uh, you know, I don't want to ever build Zoom, for example. That, <laughs> seems, that seems exceedingly dull. That seems like a thoroughly unenjoyable program to work on. Uh, however, I'm glad somebody wants to build that because it's pretty useful. Uh, you know, whatever complaints or criticisms we might have about zoom or its quality or whatever uh from time to time still pretty useful piece of software overall um especially in the last two years so you know the, the world has room for everybody and i try not to take those time those types of things personally i'm just well sorry you didn't enjoy your time as much as maybe you could have if i had other examples but if i did i wouldn't be me and then i would be quite sad and so uh right. well you know if the two of us, uh, if one of the two of us has to be unhappy, sorry, random student, <laughs> I'm going to choose me. Don't get me wrong. You seem like a nice person. However, speaking I like myself of, just a little better. Speaking of teaching with video games, you used to teach at a Full Sail University. Is that is that correct? I did. I had the, yep. I had the pleasure of touring Full Sail very briefly in my, okay. uh, uh, during, during high school, but um, I know a couple of people from it. I'm not personally doing anything game development related uh, as a career, but I was just, I was curious about it. And, uh, um, what did you, what did you like? How, what was that like? Could you tell us about that experience? The sure. Full Sail? Uh, let's see. So I actually went to Full Sail uh, as, a, as a student uh, a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away. Um, and by galaxy far, far away, I mean about five miles down the road because <laughs> uh, I, I live there uh, or nearby there. Uh, so um, I came to Florida to go to school there and uh, studied video game programming as, uh, as my undergrad. And then uh, when I got out, I got a job at Electronic Arts for a little bit. And uh, I was working in their QA department uh, as a tester on, on Madden. Uh, Madden... 2002, which dates me a little bit. Um, <laughs> show of hands, uh, who was born on or after 2002? 2002. <laughs> uh, <laughs> all right, sounds good, sounds good. Um, so, uh, yeah, so I, I did that for a little bit and I, uh, you know, it was, it was okay. Um, being a tester was, you know, it was all right. It wasn't uh, glorious or glamorous. Uh, certainly wasn't just, oh, you play video games all day. That must be the greatest job ever. No, no, it's not the greatest job ever. Uh, it's not the worst job ever either. So, you know, it was a job. Um, but as an example of how not fun it could be, uh, from time to time, we'd have to, you know, test very specific things. Every now and again, we'd have sort of free testing periods where it really is just, you know, do broad sweeps over everything and, spot what's busted and write up a report and you know yada 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 but occasionally we would get checklists and okay just go through this checklist does this work does this work and and so on and so forth at one point though uh we were we were testing on uh, madden for the pc and uh, i got saddled with the installer checklist and so that is as glorious as it sounds. Uh, if, if you've got uh, an image of your head of, you know, just parties and, uh, you know, people just throwing money around all over, just champagne spilling out over every glass, that's exactly what it was, totally. Uh, uh. <laughs> no, no, not even close, not even close. Uh, <laughs> but I had to test the installer for a variety of situations on a variety of operating systems. So we had uh, a whole array of, of computers with, Windows 98 and Windows 2000 and this version of Windows 2000 and so on and so forth. So I would just go down the line and basically hit start on each one of these. And uh, can the installer start on Windows 98? Check. Can the installer start on Windows 2000? Check. And uh, then fun features like if you cancel partway through the installation and resume, does the installation complete successfully on Windows 98 and 2000 and yada, yada, yada. Uh, you know, if you hit cancel and completely cancel, does it delete all of the temporary files it created and so on? Uh, and so, you know, I had to do that for a, a couple of weeks uh, and that was not great, but you know, 
it was a job. Uh, you know, just think every every feature of every game of every piece of software, uh, somebody had to design it, come up with some ideas on how to implement it, implement it, test it, integrate it, test some more, and so on, just to make sure that when you click that button, that button does what you expect it to do or what the program claims it's going to do. Uh, and that's, you know, not always a glorious job, but somebody's got to do it. So anyway, this was a little detour on the original question. I haven't forgotten. And so uh, the uh, so I did that for a little while. And uh, after we wrapped on Madden, uh, I was going to switch over to another project because normally uh, QA departments will, will um, or at least at the time, it may be different now at different places, but uh, EA would really just terminate all of their QA testers because there was nothing for them to do, right? The, the product was done. It had shipped. I'm like, all right, thank you for your, uh, for your work. And... Uh, you know, we'll call you in a year or so when we start ramping up again. And uh, so they, they realized that that was not a great idea. They wanted to keep people on board, especially the better testers and so on. Uh, so they started insourcing, again, the opposite of outsourcing. They started uh, uh, taking on other EA Studios uh, projects for testing and started to become like a major testing center for all of Electronic Arts. So I was going to move on to another project after Madden, which was uh, Command and Conquer generals i think it was called uh it was like the first 3d command and conquer 20 years ago uh which i was excited about but uh i got contacted by one of my old instructors who i still kept in touch with a little bit and uh, and he told me that uh you know my old school was expanding they needed more people uh specifically um they called them lab instructors over there but essentially tas or peer mentors and uh you know so i went in and uh and met with one of my old teachers and interviewed and all that and uh the job paid better than I was currently making at EA. And also we didn't have any concept of crunch time, which was great uh, because uh, when we wrapped up Madden, it was um, it was to the point where we were doing 75, 80 hour work weeks. And uh, you know, it was, it was a, a, a slow, uh, a slow shift to that. If you've ever heard the expression of boiling a frog, uh, it was very much like that where, you know, we do 40 hours a week, nine to five more or less. And then, um, uh, we would go to like nine to six every day and then maybe nine to seven. And then we started to do nine to five, including Saturdays. And then it was nine to six, including Saturdays. And gradually, gradually we added more and more time. And then it was seven, eight, 12 hours a day, seven days a week. Uh, I tell students, uh, uh, my last, uh, my last day of crunch time there was, uh, or last day of, of the project, we did a 20 hour day. Uh, so we came in at uh, 1 p.m. and we left at like uh, uh, 9 a.m. the next morning. And so we're down to three or four bugs left in the database. And, uh, you know, it's just, uh, all right, well, uh, the developers, they're working on bug number two. So just hang tight, guys. Uh, when they're done, uh, they'll, they'll send me a build. This is our project lead. Uh, they'll send us a, a build and then I'll make copies and give them all to you. And then we can test just that one bug. And, you know, here it is two in the morning. We're all just passed out trying not to drool on ourselves and you know whatever else and like what are we doing here what what is what is our life right now um and then okay we got the build test that yep we're good all right hang tight they're going to work on bug number three and uh you know until we get all of them finished and then great now we've got a gold build that'll get sent out and uh you know then patches can start being uh, worked on and all this kind of stuff because we would still have bugs where it's like that's eh, okay to ship that one and, and uh and so on but um so the prospect of uh, making a little bit more money and uh, not having to do, uh, you know, 20 hour work days or whatever else, that sounds great. That sounds like just heaven on earth. And uh, so I, I switched over and did that uh, fully intending that that would be a temporary thing. I was like, you know, I'll do this for a little while and then I'll, you know, get a real job as a, as a game programmer or something like that. And uh, did that for a little while and found I really enjoyed it. And, uh, you know, it was just really um, a really rewarding experience uh, to help out what essentially were my peers because I really wasn't much older than uh, than you know the, the students there. Um, in fact, I know for a fact there were you know many students that we had that were older than me. Uh, in some cases, doing co career switches. So it's like, wait a minute, you are qualified to teach this course, and yet here I am as your lab instructor trying to help you. Like this feels super weird. You, you could be my father, and you're asking this. I've never been in this scenario before. Um, <laughs> but uh, 
uh, you know, so anyway, I did that for a number of years and, uh, and then an opportunity came where uh, one of my old instructors moved uh, to another class. He sort of moved sideways and taught something else. There was an opening to teach one of the classes that I had been working in as a lab instructor for many years. And so my name was put forward by somebody and I was like, wait, what me? No, I don't. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know. I like responsibility. I don't think so. you want There's somebody else named Joshua Fox, right? That, Cause I don't think we have the right person in mind. Uh, but once I got over that terrifying prospect, uh, you know, I gave it a shot and uh, then I was in charge of a whole class and uh, also found that rewarding and so on. And that was, you know, 20 something years ago. Now, nah, maybe not quite that much. 15, 16, what the hell year are we in now? 2022, yeah, 15, 16 years ago or so. Um, and, uh, you know, been doing it ever since. And then four or five years ago, uh, somebody I worked with, uh, Dr. Blanchard, for uh, those who, who know him, uh, he uh, also worked at Full Sail for a little while. He came there after I did, but uh, when he left and came to UF, uh, you know, he would always tell us, oh man, it's so much better at UF. Everything is so much more awesome. You remember all that stuff we always complain about? Uh, there's none of that at UF. It's awesome. We're like, dude, shut up. Seriously, shut up already. We get it. And then uh, after, I don't know, a year of that, I was like, all right, fine. You know what? I'll check it out. And uh, and then here I am. Uh, so that was a very, very long answer to your question. I realize that now. Uh, but no, that's the, I mean, that's what we're here for. We wanted <laughs> yeah, to learn about your, your game development background. And like, um, I got you. I mean, yeah, no, this that's a great answer. Um, I guess I, I personally am more curious about like like what specifically you you taught while at Full Sail, I guess. Okay, uh, just okay, I got you. I'm curious, but yeah. sure. So I taught uh, very very similar to things that I teach now at uh, at UF. So uh, I taught. Uh, the, the course I taught the longest was one called 3D Content Creation, and uh, it was very similar to, uh, for any who may have uh, taken my Introduction to Digital Arts and Sciences course uh, here at UF, it's very similar to that. So it was like an intro to art and graphics for programmers. Uh, so, you know, anything that a, a programmer might want or need to know about working with art assets or doing graphic programming and things like that. Uh, maybe not everything that we need to know. There's only so much time in the, in a term. Um, but, uh, you know, for some who, who may or any other, some who don't uh, at full sale, a term is only four weeks. So take an entire semester's worth of content at UF, squash it into four weeks. And, uh, and that's pretty much what you get. Uh, so you'd go to class for eight hours a day in one course, as opposed to 50 minutes, uh, which when I first, uh, you know, when I first came to UF, that was a big adjustment for me. I was like, 50 minutes. Are you kidding me? I take breaks longer than this at full sail. This is super weird. How am I going to by the time I've started, the day's already over in 15. What is, okay, uh, you know, I get over it eventually, but uh, it was a big, uh, a big shift. So I taught that, uh, uh, that was the first class that I moved into. And then a little while later, like many places, uh, you know, how can we do more with, with the same amount or whatever else? And then we started teaching uh, multiple courses. Uh, and then uh, I, I uh, taught uh, a programming fundamentals two course uh which uh, works out perfectly because uh you know here i am at uf teaching programming fundamentals too and uh you know so more or less same same kind of material introductory programming and all that good stuff um and uh i talked let's see what else i teach uh mostly that i mean we we very much uh you know got people into into a groove and and that was kind of their course um it, we we really didn't kind of bounce from one teacher to the next one term to the next like we might sometimes do at uh, at uf or other big universities um which uh i prefer I, I prefer to get into sort of a groove and stay in that groove i don't like to necessarily shake things up every other day or whatever because uh, it takes me time to adjust to new patterns and routines and so on so i would much rather stay in a pattern uh because it, and this is me, just me personally I, it takes me a very long time to get kind of ramped up uh so when there's a ton of new tasks i just just know it's going to take me a very long time because of how how slow my acceleration is essentially um i sometimes use the the mario kart metaphor i'm one of the the heavy drivers in mario kart where uh, put me in a straight line i'm fine Making a lot of tight turns and corners and bouncing off walls i'm just i'm totally hosed because uh it takes me a while to get back up to speed so kind of the same stuff uh same stuff i teach uh, i teach here is I when see. i talk there i see we we uh um Oh, I, I suppose GDA, like as a as a club, we try to do a good bit of like 
game dev teaching in the past so we've had like like uh 3d modeling lectures and stuff uh, but i that, that's cool. I, I'll just say I'm, I'm personally inspired by your PowerPoints. They're some of the most efficient and like clear that I've seen. Like, but um, well, I appreciate that. I'm actually in the process of perhaps. rewriting some of them now. Wow. <laughs> yeah, for uh, for my my uh, new online gig, uh, taking all those and and uh, turning them into videos and and you know doing uh, you know recordings that are you know this is the recording for this particular topic instead of me doing it live. Even though I used to record them, you know, in case students wanted to review or whatever. But right. um, it's uh, it's definitely a different process of uh, recording some you know concise version of a topic. Uh, you know, a lot of my little jokes and asides and things like that. Uh, I kind of strip those out uh, because. Uh, uh, you know, it, it's different for a live audience than it is for a recording. Uh, I started putting some of those in there. I'm like, ah, this just sounds, this doesn't sound right in a, in a recording format, you know, in, in a live studio audience. It's totally different. But uh, yeah, so I'm going through all that right now. Um, your, uh, your anecdote about testing was really interesting because I don't think that's a field like that's not someone like who we had a guest speaker on before who does like video game testing. So um, and especially for indie developers, which a lot of us are, if at all, um, testing sort of falls to the wayside behind art and programming and like making new content rather than testing what's already been made. Sure. So do you have any tips or methodologies or approaches or mindsets that you picked up when you were as an EA tester that maybe some of us indie developers could benefit from? Uh, let's see. When it comes to testing, uh, it it can be a challenge when we're doing it ourselves because we it's it's like a writer trying to edit their own work, uh, their own novel. Um, that's why editors exist because an editor doesn't know what the story is or what the the you know the the book is and so they'll read it carefully and methodically and like i i don't know the thought process of who wrote this uh i'm just going to edit the words that i see on the page um which is very different than seeing the words that are on the page and being in the head of the person who wrote it um so when it comes to things like that if we're editing our own stuff um, which I've seen this uh, again, going back to the idea that I'm, I'm rewriting a bunch of uh, lectures and things like this. Now, part of that recording process is me writing a script of everything that I would say for this lecture. So when it comes to actually do the recording, I, I make sure I say what I need to say, as opposed to, ah, I'll just sort of wing it. Uh, Cause then if I forget something, it's like, Oh, whack, ugh, crap. I forgot that. Hold on. Let me go back. And now the recording's all messed up and jumbled or whatever. So writing that script, um, you know, I'll write it, send it off to somebody uh, who makes a different version of the PowerPoint slides, sends it back to me for review, and I'll go and I'll read, does this all line up? Yeah, okay, that seems good, maybe make some tweaks or whatever. But then when actually doing the recording, uh, this has happened pretty much every single time I've recorded one of these, uh, as I'm reading my own script, my own words that I wrote, uh, I'll see words that are jumbled up and in, in half of my brain is like, ah, oh, just keep going, do the thing, do the thing. The other half of my brain is like, what jerk face wrote this script? These, these typos are everywhere. What, oh my God, who, what idiot is responsible for this? Oh, it's me. It's, it's my own. These are all my own words. How on earth did this happen? Uh, because as I'm writing it, I'm in my own thought patterns and processes and so on. So bringing that back around to the actual question, uh, it can be difficult when we're testing something because we know what to look for. We know what we want to check off as, yeah, that's done. And, uh, you know, that might be, well, in order to run and jump across this pit, I need to push the button at exactly this time to jump across the pit. There, I did it. Obviously, it works. I'm able to jump across the pit. We're not thinking, well, what happens if I run towards the pit and then stop and hit the button? What happens if I hit the button a second too late or too early? What happens if I try and stop in midair and backtrack? What happens if I try and jump after I fall off the edge of the cliff? Can I jump in midair? Have I thought about implementing or preventing the implementation of that? And so on and so forth. And there's tons of things that we don't think about because we're thinking about the one way to do it right. And as I'm sure you've all experienced uh, as, as uh, just playing games, you might try weird things from time to time, right? Uh, what happens if I tried to jump over this wall? Can I climb this wall? What happens if I charge full steam into this seemingly destructible object uh, that may or may not actually be destructible? And you know, whatever random things you try, 
players will do the same thing. And if you don't think about that, if you don't try and put some system in place to account for that, well, then who the heck knows what's going to happen. So getting your, getting your game into the hands of someone who has never seen it before or never touched it before can be extremely valuable. And some of you may have already encountered something like that. You know, give it to a stranger, give it to your significant other, give it to your friends, family members, or whatever else. And then take a step back and shut the heck up and just watch and see what happens. Because something where you think, oh my God, this is so obvious. Everyone knows how to do this. Everyone does not know how to do that. If there's one person on the planet that doesn't know how to do that, everyone knows how to do this is crap and just straight up not true. So if everyone knows how to do this isn't true, maybe there's also a large number of people that don't know how to do this. And all right, then we back it up and we, you know, throw our ego uh, out the window a little bit and say, all right, maybe I didn't do a good job of developing this. And, you know, maybe the player's not an idiot and so on and so forth. And then, you know, see what we can do from there. But we don't always know that until, you know, we give it to somebody and see what they do. Um, now that said, Maybe you're making some sort of a game like, uh, let's see, well, there's El Elden Ring just came out recently, but the, the, the Dark Souls series of games, right? They're pretty well known for difficulty level and not necessarily holding the player's hand and whatever else. If you're making a game like that in a particular genre that has a very particular style for a certain kind of audience and blah, 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 it is okay to say, you know what? This is the type of game I'm making. And if someone doesn't get it, well, then that is their fault. And, you know, that's, I'll own that. I will, I will chisel that in stone. This is the experience I intended for the player. And some people might not get that and they might not like it and that's okay. Uh, but for most other situations, uh, you know, you have to figure out, well, why didn't, well, why did this person have, have some difficulty with this? Uh, could I make this a better experience for them? And by extension, possibly for lots of other people, um, so that's one thing to, to keep in mind. Something else, you know, just trying all kinds of random stuff in ways that you never even considered in, in all possible environments. Uh, test every possible combination of everything you can think of. Uh, as an example, when we were working on Madden, uh, the general schedule for EA was, um, or in terms of, of like uh, milestones for, for builds and, and overall progress, Going from like alpha to beta to, to gold, uh, there were certain quantities and, and types of bugs that could be in the database. Um, the big big milestone change was going from alpha to beta. And when we switched from alpha to beta officially, uh, one of the criteria for that was no crashes of any kind in the bug database. If there are any crashes, we cannot go to beta because that that's just the way it goes. So. You know, we're trying to prioritize those kinds of things, and the developers are, of course, as well. Um, two days or so before we were going to go into beta, uh, one of uh, one of the other testers, this guy named Marvin, he uh, he found some random random ass bug that uh, he uh, none of us had really thought about before. So the the menu system in Madden for that particular version um, had like next and previous buttons in the bottom corners of the screen. So, you know, that was just your main navigation. And behind the uh, the interface in, in the background was really just kind of a big white void that had uh, 3D models of football players doing something like running, uh, you know, blocking a tackle or, you know, throwing a pass and then it would kind of fade out and another character would fade in, do some animations or whatever. So what, uh, what Marvin had discovered is if you clicked on uh, say the next button while the screen was kind of fading out and the new menu system was coming in. If you clicked the previous button really quickly and frantically, you know, 10 times in a second, uh, it would just screw up everything. Uh, the whole rendering system would get hosed and suddenly uh, all the colors got weird and inverted. Like you're looking at a negative of a photo. And uh, I'm sure some of you have seen um, what we sometimes call the hall of mirrors effect where an image gets rendered on top of itself. Like it's not clearing out the older images that would happen as well. So suddenly, you know, here's a picture of some quarterback throwing a pass and then all the colors get inverted and you're just seeing trails and images of every 
frame of the end and just like, what is, ha- I'm on drugs all of a sudden. And uh, so, you know, he calls us all over, guys, look what I did. This is awesome. And of course we all agree. Well done, Marvin. That is awesome. And uh, <laughs> how did you do that? And so he shows, I just click this and then I click this. This is bonkers. And we're like, huh, I never thought about that. Cool. I'm going to try that. Me too. Me too. So we all go back to our stations and all of us try this and all of us experience the same thing. So, you know, totally confirmed. This is a major issue. But then we also found in doing that, whatever weird, you know, drug induced land we were transported to uh, had bugs aplenty. And so uh, upon doing that, the game crashed pretty much everywhere. Uh, just about anything we tried to do afterward resulted in some sort of crash. So here we are two days before beta when all crashes should be removed from the database. And we, as the testing team, put in something like 18 or 19 new crash bugs uh, in a single day. And uh, so the the developers were not wild about this. Management was not wild about this. Um, Our testing lead, he brings us all into a conference room and he's like, all right, guys, serious talk everybody's about to be fired. So uh, here's why. And, you know, in hindsight, that's really a stupid threat to be like, oh, great, fire the people who are actually making this thing. It's going to be (laughs) super quick, right? Uh, The the battlefield uh, paradigm. (laughs) (laughs) Right. So, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, You know, the best way to fix bugs is totally fire everyone. Got it, got it. Uh, Including the testers who are finding these things. So, you know, everybody was catching flack for this because uh, this is not true of all games. Uh, But, once in a while, the game is going to come out on a very specific schedule. Uh, and this is pretty much always true for Madden. Uh, it comes out on or around the first football game of the season, uh, typically the preseason. Like every year, that's the release date for Madden. So football fans can get on board with this as soon as football season starts. That's not true of all games. Uh, you know, lots of games are like, eh, it'll come out in a couple months. It'll come out, eh, got pushed back a week or two, whatever, no big deal. Uh, although sometimes if it gets pushed back too much, people freak out and it's like, all right, it's going to come out on this day, no matter what. And then it comes out that day and it's not great. Cyberpunk 2077 and so on and so forth. Right. So th- th- that's a whole other thing. But, uh, you know, if everyone kind of lost their mind and uh, we're like, well, we're, we're doing the best we can. Uh, we never thought this random sequence of events would ever be used. Ultimately, the workaround that was implemented was anytime you click that next or previous button, there was like a three second delay before you could click on any of the other buttons and boom, bug fixed. And all of the bugs fixed because we just, you know, put a giant safety bubble around everything and uh, problem solved. Right. I'm sure that was uh, you know, a very hotly debated issue. Like, should we do this? Should we bother fixing these at all? You know, whatever else, but Fun times like that can happen. Uh, so the point of that is test things you, in your wildest dreams, would never imagine that this could possibly have any sort of issues because you never know. And, uh, you know, thank you, Marvin, for uh, your random clicking and, uh, you know, stuff like that. So that's crazy. You really just kind of have an open mind about what could possibly go wrong and assume anything you think that is correct and good, uh, assume it's not. Play, play the adversarial role for a second and say, I hate this game and I want to break it as much as possible. I want to see my project fail. How can I prove that? How can I prove this thing is terrible and list all the flaws? And with that sort of mentality of I hate this and I want to kill it, then you can maybe, uh, you know, try out all the things. The, the firing threat is really fascinating. That's a, that, I mean, that, that plays on the trope of EA, right? I mean, everyone kind of and this is this is a while uh, ago too. This isn't like in our recent memory. This no. is decades ago, right? Sure, sure. Uh, so along those lines, uh, I mean, I still have some some friends who work at EA uh, at that same studio and have for many years now. Uh, EA has gone through changes uh, and. EA is, you know, the the massive umbrella entity, but there are numerous sub studios, EA Tiburon and there's EA Redwood and, you know, blah, blah, whatever. But EA has gone through changes over the years. Um, You know, there was, I I don't know if any of you have heard of uh, EA Spouse from years and years ago. I mean, you were all probably like five years old when this happened. 
Uh, so it's not surprising you haven't heard of it. Uh, but uh, this happened probably about 15 years ago or so, maybe even more. There was uh, somebody who just went by the name EA Spouse, and uh, they made a bunch of blog posts and, and things like that, um, where they they talked about their experience as the spouse of an EA employee and how it was essentially destroying their life. And, uh, you know, their spouse worked crazy long hours, never took vacation, uh, basically couldn't take vacation, which is not great. Uh, and, uh, you know, I've, I've experienced that before where it's like, yeah, technically I've got X number of hours that I can just say I'm out. But that also means the things that I would normally get done in that time aren't going to get done. And so that might affect somebody else or some other course or whatever later on down the line. So I kind of can't take vacation and, you know, that's a whole other thing. Uh, you know, you, you could and should from time to time just say, I'm out and, uh, you know, I'll pick up in two weeks. And if you don't like it, well, too bad. Complain to me in two weeks because uh, I'm out of here. Uh, and, and that can be a good for just general, you know, mental health and all that good stuff. Um, but in any case, with, with the EA spouse sort of... Um, debacle uh, uh, situation um, that started a lot of people talking about quality of life and work-life balance and all this kind of stuff in the games industry. And we still talk about that stuff today in all kinds of industries. You know, there's got to be boundaries between work and life and so on. Um, and, you know, they, they made some positive changes as a result, but, you know, every given day has, uh, you know, some new potential uh, president or CEO or whatever that may have new rules and policies right. and, you know, it's just the way it goes. Some studios have have unofficial crunch time, you know, where it's uh, no management says five o'clock, go home, have a nice day. We'll see you tomorrow. But someone says, I just kind of want to stay here and work for another hour because I like this stuff. And someone else is like, yeah, me too. I'll work and I'll keep you company. And then a bunch of people do that. And then six o'clock rolls around. And you're like, well, you know, I don't really have anything else to do at home right now. Let's do this for another four hours. And suddenly the whole studio is in unofficial permanent crunch because nobody wants to leave. And then some new person shows up and is like, wow, everybody stays until 10 o'clock. I feel weird leaving. Is that, is that wrong of me to leave? It's totally not wrong, but I feel like it is. So I'm going to stay, even though I kind of don't want to. And that's a weird thing. Um, I, I read an interview with uh, some members of uh, Naughty Dog who uh, were talking about that, working on like The Last of Us and things like that, where everybody there wanted to make the best experience possible. So they voluntarily stayed very long hours. And it just kind of became this unofficial thing, like nobody's making us do this, but we don't want to leave because we want this to be the greatest experience we can possibly craft. And, you know, how do you how do you stop that short of locking the doors and saying, go home, everyone we will pick it up tomorrow. Uh, you know, that's, that's kind of how it is You know, with creative individuals. They might just polish something forever until you take it away from them and say, thanks, you polished it enough. It's really good. Uh, so. You know, so there's a balance to strike in there, and certainly, I had no idea that, that was a phenomenon. Like that, that's not, yeah. that's not a, I don't know, that, that doesn't, it's, it's not an intuitive. Like, I think everyone when they think of crunch, they think of like the the boss whipping away at the like, but the, but that's not that that's intriguing. That it's more of like a peer pressure yeah. phenomenon. Sometimes that's that, that's really interesting. Um, yeah. I mean, yeah. sometimes you just really like the thing you're doing and you don't want to stop doing it because, you know, a bell rang or it's some arbitrary, you know, marker in, in the day. Development uh, can certainly be addicting. Yeah. I, yeah. yeah. You know, I think that and it a, could be, you know, it could be writing a novel or painting something or it was, I'm loving this painting and I, you know, uh, yeah, I put 500 hours into it. it's this tiny little six by six painting, but I just, I couldn't stop. I just kept adding tiny more details and it just consumed me and, you know, and someone else might see and be like, oh yeah, that, that's pretty cool. You know, yeah, whatever. <laughs> and then move on with your life. Like, you have no idea what I put into this. Um, but sometimes that's, that's what the creative mind wants and does. And, uh, you know, Really good companies, I think they will they will sort of learn how how their employees work and give them the tools for them to be happy doing what they do best. And uh, you know whether that is nine to five every single day and that's it, or 
the shop is open 24 seven. You've all got access cards and come and go as you please. Uh, if you want to work from 3 PM to 4 PM only on any given day, but you somehow get everything done. Awesome. Do what you got to do. And uh, well, I'll see you tomorrow between three and 4 PM. Cause that's the only time you actually work in the office. Um, you know, it, it work gets done then really who cares? That, that's that's what I think should be the, the norm everywhere. But it's easy for people to take advantage of that if you're not careful. But, uh, you know, when we're talking about things like not only just games, but creative endeavors, and this could also be just, you know, boring software companies or, or something like that. But uh, uh, if you give people the, the tools to work with and the environment to thrive in, they'll make cool stuff and they'll keep doing it because they want to be there. So big companies like Google and, and uh, Pixar and things like that have figured that stuff out for the most part, at least uh, there's occasionally issues at those companies too. I know Google has certainly had some in the last couple of years, but um, you know, by and large, that's why they get to be so big because they, they figure out uh, how to, how to get the most out of the employees basically, which as I say that, I just hear how that could potentially sound. Get the most out of the employees, like you're squeezing every drop of, you know, creative energy or, or whatever out of them. But really healthy employees thrive, whatever that means. Uh, Nicholas Cancio asks, will not corporate just replace you with someone who is willing to spend all day in the office? Which is interesting because we are in an ever competitive world where there's, there's certainly a a, a more globalized economy now where like you, you can be pretty easily replaced by someone that is willing to, to make a significant more value because their country's currency is worth less, for example, like East Asia or, you know, just a lot of like remote work these days from studios. Sure. And that's, that is definitely true. Uh, you know, as much as uh, in the, this kind of gets to a larger issue, not just unique to, you know, games or any other sort of uh, industry, but if, um, if you look at just trying to get the, the cheapest product out the door or get a product out the door for the lowest cost, um, outsourcing is the way to do it. I mean, that's, that's, that is objective fact, uh, because in many countries, uh, the, cost of living compared to, you know, salary requirements and so on, uh, it's cheaper to pay someone who lives somewhere else that either pays less in taxes or, you know, the cost of living is less because of all kinds of various things. Uh, so that's the way to do it cheaper. Uh, but if you don't want to care only about the cheapest possible price, uh, you know, in, in creating jobs locally or whatever else, then well, pay a higher wage. You know, we're kind of talking about that now as a society a little bit, not nearly as much as it could, um, you know, with all kinds of talks of federal minimum wages and, you know, and all this sort of other sort of stuff. The UBI and all that, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and so, you know, going forward, and I think a lot of people who are opposed to that, it's, it's very short-sighted because, I mean, just try and look forward five, 10, 20 years in the future, like what, what is sustainable? And uh, I think, unfortunately, uh, which this starts to get into other areas and, you know, we don't want to be too cynical about things, but uh, people will say, yeah, sure, sure, sure. That is like a 20 years in, into the future. That's going to be super big problem. Yeah, great. Uh, I'm not really going to be around then. So I kind of don't care. Uh, or I've got tons of money myself. So yeah, I really don't care as well. Um, basically, I just don't care for a variety of reasons. Take your pick. And uh yeah, complain to my secretary or, you know, my assistant or whatever else, um, which is unfortunate, but kind of true in the reality in some cases, you know. Yeah. Yeah. So things have changed a little over the years with uh, with funding sources, like in, in the earliest days of, of game development, nobody could afford it because it was just ludicrously expensive. So everybody had to get big publishers. They had to go to EA or Ubisoft or whatever and say, I've got this awesome game, this cool idea, a team that is willing to do all this work. Please, oh, please give us some money so we can make this game. And the big publisher would say, well, yeah, okay, I suppose I'm going to give you, you know, a million dollars over some number of years and so on, but uh, I'm going to ask for 40% royalties or, you know, some bonkers number and, and all this kind of stuff. And they call all the shots. Um, that still happens sometimes today, but there's all kinds of cheaper ways to do game development 
game engines are basically free everywhere. Um, you know, the Unreal Engine used to cost almost a million dollars to license. It was like seven or eight hundred thousand uh, dollars. It's free nowadays. So cool. Uh, there are you know paid tiers if you want you know tech support and you know uh, the, the personal number of someone you can call at four in the morning. And be like, dude, my build is totally hosed right now. I need your assistance. And that guy's like, right on it, boss. And uh, you know you pay for that level of support. Uh, or if not, then you're just, you know, taking the free version and, uh, you know, make a post on the forum and wait five weeks and hopefully somebody helps. Uh, but, you know, you get the job in the end. Uh, so there's many options nowadays uh, and there's, you know, crowdfunding and Kickstarter and so many ways where people can make and, and afford to make games that you get more creative freedom as opposed to, well, I have to, I, I'm, I'm subject to the whims of this publisher. And the publisher might say, this game will come out on April 4th, 2023, or else. Uh, and by or else, we just stop paying you. Uh, so hopefully you release it by then. Otherwise, you know, you just send us all the source code and all the art assets, and then we'll uh, pay somebody in another country to finish this for much cheaper. And, uh, and then we'll give you nothing because you're in breach of contract. You didn't release this thing. So that's why people will hit crunch time because they're like, man, we're totally going to fall short of that milestone or that deadline. So crunch, 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 crunch. Game comes out. It's not great. Terrible reviews, blah, blah, blah. Like, why did they just wait another two months to release it? Because they had zero dollars, literally zero dollars. And that is an unfortunate reality in a lot of cases. So that is, that is, that's insightful. That's really interesting. I mean, indie dev has the potential to be more lucrative than ever before, but yeah, like you yeah. said, yeah. You know, and there's, there's so many ways that, you know, you can, you can make something for cheap, put it out there in the world. And if it happens to do great or even kind of okay, then all right, neat. You made a little bit of money and you didn't really spend a tremendous amount of money to make it in the first place. So, you know, you break even and, and then, uh, you know, go on to the next one. And then maybe that one that is already out there makes a little bit of money, trickles in a little over time. And eventually you have two titles that are out that slowly trickle in and, you know, there's, there's definitely, there's definitely that growing demographic of like indie developers that are that are creating small games while they work another actual like core career job and then they use it as like passive income and occasionally they have a big hit because they worked on something like once every weekend with their best friend uh solace comes to mind one of the like first unreal engine 4 titles that they like showed off and they were like oh yeah we worked on it you know like 12 hours every weekend for a year and we made a game and it was like a yeah. top selling kind of thing so very very interesting yeah. If you have that that kind of discipline uh, to you know to keep up with that, you know it's like building building a house out of bricks. Eventually, you've got to lay four hundred thousand bricks, or uh, however many bricks are in a house, right? So just one at a time, and eventually they'll all be placed. It doesn't have to be all in one day or in a year, but one at a time until there are no more. So. Discipline's huge. We have a we have a workshop coming up. Our members have voted for the first time on a non game dev related workshop on like discipline for the next week. So we'll see how that goes. Just discussing. Yeah. Um, I mean, that's yeah. that's the thing, you know. Uh, you know, as, as an example of, of, of laying bricks, uh, you know, some of you may have uh, heard me offhandedly reference so uh, once or twice in class, I, I have a huge Lego collection, uh, just as a hobby. And uh, when I say huge, I mean, huge uh you know all, all around me behind me this is why i have a virtual background because my workspace is just full of, <laughs> of lego bricks uh but uh you know from time to time i'm, I'm just too busy and, and can't uh, you know build anything or you know partake in my hobby or whatever else uh but at one point when i was uh, uh you know studying and uh, and getting a master's degree uh was building a set and i was like man i really want to build this but i have like no time anywhere so uh, i would just open like one little bag out of you know the 28 or something in this thing like once a week basically all right i'm give myself like 30 minutes to decompress or something and then slowly you know after a couple of weeks, the big thing was built. And normally I'd, you know, like to sit down and build something in an entire session or something like that. But, uh, you know, you just do it a little bit at a time and uh, you eventually get to your goal. So whether it's game development or whatever, write one line of code a day. Awesome. At the end of the year, you've got 365 lines of code, which could be an entire product, depending on, you know, what, what it is that thing does. Um, you know, Where's Andrew? Or whatever else. We've got, we've got a... Andrew in the in the call who I, I'm just gonna call you out here, Andrew. We had a uh, we had a oh. one hi we had a 100 days of game dev initiative over, okay. over last summer where we tried to incentivize a, a 
points with various rewards for uh, every day that someone would post some sort of progress. And uh, Andrew okay. here has been going strong since then. He's on he's on day 331, I think, today. Oh, look at that. That's fantastic. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Nice. He hasn't missed a day. Streaks. Yeah. <laughs> well done. Yeah. Well done. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, hats off to you, Andrew. That is fantastic. And and that can be a huge challenge, well, even even just a small amount of progress, right? I mean, same thing if you're you know, doing anything, if you're working out or or you know, trying to get through a, a book or whatever else. Look, I don't have time to read five chapters a day. Well, read one page a day, and then eventually you'll read a chapter, and then eventually you'll be done. Uh, progress might not be as quickly as as, as uh, or quick as we like, but you know, more than zero is more than zero. Um, so do we have any questions from the audience? Because I know it's been Michael and I have been mostly asking the questions. Do you guys have anything you'd like to ask uh, Professor Fox? Fox dropping truth bombs this afternoon. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. A lot of, lot of little I mean, I try, you know, I try and do that, especially as uh, in, in, in class, uh, class is because I know I, um, you know, I've, I've got an audience, you know, I've got a captive yeah, audience, yeah, not it's... only teaching, uh, you know, programming or, you know, whatever else, but here's how you might improve yourself as a person as well, you know, right. beyond just, okay, I need to know this, what do I need to know for the test or whatever else, learn some stuff that might help you in life. There's uh, definitely, there's a reason why the CS community at this school really appreciates you, Professor Fox, like there's, I know, right. I think you, I think you recently discovered the, I, okay, Dr. Blanchard made a surprise appearance on the CS Discord, and he told us that he showed you the the logo of it. <laughs> did you Did you hear about that? Uh, yes. <laughs> they did. Yes. Yes. <laughs> the, the eyes, like, oh my god. But no. yeah, yeah, no. But people, people really, they, they really appreciate you, and I think it's because of the. the yeah. It is the it is the truth bombs, and it is the the quality of uh, 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 of lectures. I think it certainly sets a. a a standard and an inspiration for other people trying to like teach programming um or yeah, yeah like we well, i just i think you know over the years i mean there's all kinds of things that we learn eventually and uh you know sometimes it's it's technical skills oh here's the way you use you know a, a vector in c plus plus or whatever the heck uh but then you know the the kind of unspoken bits and pieces of well here's why you might want to do x y or z or here's a slightly better way to think about this kind of problem that you know these sort of softer skills that are hard to find in courses because you know often we have to have uh, as an instructor i have to set up learning objectives and okay this topic is going to be tested where exactly in the course what test what assignment or whatever uh, but a lot of these softer skills changing the way we think about things those are hard to measure, right? Uh, you know, true or false, you now think differently about programming. Oh, well, the answer true. So clearly I've done my job, right? And uh, they are transformed as a student. Uh, <laughs> I, I like to think I help students in that transformation, but I can't measure it. Uh, and, you know, so I, I do the best I can with that sort of stuff. But, uh, you know, and, and I know some students uh, have expressed appreciation for that. And uh, like the student who doesn't like video game examples, uh, some students have expressed uh, a, a uh, dislike of that sort of stuff and like ah uh, you know he goes off on too many tangents and he should really stick more with i want to learn more about programming in his class and less about you know blah blah whatever right. okay well you know to each their own so I, yeah. I, you can't please everyone uh life lesson for the day you cannot please everyone you will not please everyone uh, and if you if you try to you will run yourself ragged and you will be frantic and stressed out and uh, as someone who is often running ragged and stressed out and frantic and anxious uh, you cannot please everyone um, that's more advice for myself than all of you uh, but uh, you know if you benefit from that too then okay great but I sometimes have to remind myself of that. Of, of, I cannot please all of my students, and I try and find a nice middle of the road approach uh, that that reaches the most number with the most benefit, knowing full well that I will fall short, and somebody will, you know, be kind of left by the wayside in some capacity, um, just because I can't please everyone, you know. So it's just the way it is. On a more superficial level, judging by the the Lego enthusiasm, is three D modeling something that you're you're into? Um, and like, what do you? I'm just curious. Do do you do a lot of three D modeling, or do, do you have a background in that? I haven't in a long time, um, and and even then, when I did, it was mostly. Uh, 
hobbyist level. Um, so when I first uh, when I first went to school, I was was split between doing a programming degree and a game art degree um, because I really I, just, I couldn't choose. And I was like, well, I like both of those things. Those both seem super cool. Tech artist. Uh, and uh, exactly right. So tech artist is, is uh, pretty much where my skill set is. So, you know, I tell people I can uh, I can, uh, you know, program better than an artist and I can make art better than a programmer. So, you know, that's that's my kind of sweet spot niche. Uh, so, you know, I like 3D modeling uh, and uh, and all that, but uh, I haven't done a lot of serious modeling in a little while, uh, which I'm working on a. a I'm in the middle of a pause of working on a game project. Uh, I, I haven't touched it in far too long at this point, but uh, whenever, <laughs> Tell us I, about that. Whoa. Uh, no whenever I get back into it, then I will uh, have to get back into 3D modeling because well, I'm making the art assets for it. Uh, so uh, are, are you working alone on this? Uh, yeah. Uh, and and at the pace that I'm going, it'll it'll be out in like 2045 or something like that. Um, what are it, the chances you know, that someone could help you for fun? <laughs> we, have a, uh, we have a club full of like people that i think we that's want true that's all i'm saying like that's... <laughs> uh that's really? that's true that's true uh that's honestly at the of... moment i don't know because really my 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 own uh oh man my work schedule for the next foreseeable ever uh it seems incredibly busy um this semester uh, has has easily been the busiest of, of the five years or so that I've been at UF, uh, and next semester is likely to be the same, and fall is likely to be the same. Uh, so I really have no idea, but maybe I'll keep that in mind, because you never know. You never know. Uh, I'm not quite sure what sort of... I'm not sure if that crosses any sort of boundaries, if there's any oh, sort of... professor-like student kind of relationship. It's kind of like a research project. Oh, yeah. These students yeah, are yeah, yeah. Just, just make it a research yeah. team, right? That's, that <laughs> is kind of how that works. I've seen, I've seen another That's student true. turn into a research team. To work That's true, because, you know, if it, is, uh, if it is within that sort of, uh, uh, that sort of confines, then, uh, yeah, I mean everything is okay because that's totally official sanctioned you know the university right. right. but as far as like personal projects yeah i don't know about that i don't know about that because there's definitely potential conflict of interest right so what are you gaining from these students are, are you you know going to profit right. off their labor and you know and that gets into exploitation issues and you know i, I would rather not run a fire <laughs> right you know. Assuming I even had time to work on it, which I don't. Uh, and so, like I said, someday, uh, 2049 or something, it'll finally come out. But, uh, and that year, that year keeps growing. Uh, I'm pretty sure at one point I told a student, ah, sometime like 2023, it'll come out. Well, that's, you know, kind of right around the corner, but uh, it's not going to happen. That's no, not, not going to happen. Uh, I, there's so many things that I want to do with it. So many uh, things that I need to rebuild. Uh, so much of the systems in there are just a, colossal mess uh that i you know I, I need to rebuild some of those because i know and i'm sure some of you have gotten this in your own projects you you start to get tangled code and then uh, technical like crossroads dead. where spaghetti. spaghetti code right so do i want to fix this code today or do something new and exciting let me uh you know research some new shader technique or whatever else yeah that's way better than untangling <laughs> and uh so i'm at the point now where the tangle needs to be untangled and uh i've got some ideas like some tools that i want to write and some you know some uh you know custom uh, uh, build tools for myself to basically help make some of the other aspects easier of building levels and environments and when i do model some 3d assets being able to import them and, and uh, access them easily through code and stuff like that so tons of work to be done there and, and that that's all going to kind of get me back to where i am right now and uh, so, you know, six months later, great, it's all untangled. What progress have you made? None at all. But man, there are no knots anymore. And that's nice. Oh. So and that'll all be, you know, 2035 or something when that really gets started again. So like, almost at five o'clock, do you have time for one more question? Uh, yeah, sure. I might even have time for a couple if you got them. All right. Okay. So this is something that I try to ask to all of our guest speakers about their positions in the game dev position. Or well, okay. So you can answer it as either as a tester from your years at EA or as a teacher. 
What's okay. something that you try to do in your position to help those that you work with? And what's something that others that you work with can do to help you do your job? So, okay. Oh, let's see. Let's see. Well, when I was a tester, a big thing, and it sounds like from, from what I understand, you guys already do this anyway. Um, just uh, sharing information. Just talk about what you're doing. You know, talk about, uh, you know, have the, the sort of water cooler conversations. Uh, you know, you're taking a break, just, uh, you know, shooting the breeze. Oh, what's going on? How's everything? Well, I was doing this the other day and, uh, you know, got stuck in this area, looked up these resources or, hey, everybody I just came across this super cool YouTube tutorial about X, Y and Z. And, uh, you know, talking about that kind of stuff, sharing information um, that can be super helpful because there's there's not a single there's not a single path that you can take to make stuff work. And, you know, as much as in, in a university environment, we try and teach things, okay, you're going to start here and then you're going to do this. You're going to do this. And there's a big old question mark and then you're going to get a job and you're going to be in the industry and cool, best of luck. Uh, you know, there's, there's not a single path necessarily. Even if we say some of those X, Y, and Z question mark steps, um, a lot of times it's X, question mark and then why question mark and then wait oh you don't even need z because one of those question marks turns out you didn't have to take that path anymore uh, and there isn't a single path for all this so you can make things work in so many different ways you can succeed by taking the weirdest craziest maze-like route to get to some destination and it can be totally okay right i mean just think about any game you've ever played today or piece of software you've used how many weird encounters, weird bugs, spaghetti lines of code are there in that product that you've experienced? Who knows? Uh, what bizarre path did someone take to go from blank code file to, oh my god, I can move this character around and jump and level up and whatever. Who knows what path they took? Uh, you know, what does the code look like for that? Who knows? Um, aside from the people who, of course, who've actually written it. Uh, so, you know, they, it could be the grossest, messiest, nastiest looking code. All their variables are some combination of A, B, and C. And uh, all right, that sounds awful, but maybe it worked for them. So, uh, you know, share information because uh, you never know what might be useful, right? With this weird, crazy, any route is possible approach, uh, anything might be helpful, you know? Uh, it's, it's like... <sighs> applying this uh, to uh, some sort of video game metaphor. It's like picking up every random item you possibly can in the world because you never know when you're going to need a random brick or a, a jug of water or a stick or whatever the heck. Uh, but sometimes it's super useful. And you're like, man, I'm glad I've been carrying around this, uh, this rusted piece of metal for the last 17 hours. And uh, it actually did have a use at some point in this experience. Uh, so as a, as a tester or just a developer, I would say sharing information can be very helpful. Um, as a teacher, same sort of thing. I mean, we talk all the time, faculty members about, hey, uh, you know, I'm thinking about doing X, Y, and Z. Anybody ever done this before or have an idea of how might I do it better? And, uh, you know, then all of us chime in. Well, you know, you could try this. You could try that. Call this person talk to that department. Or I've act I literally did that 10 minutes ago. Here's what you do. Um, <laughs> that is the theme of, you know, club, but, yeah. yeah. You know, but if we don't, if we don't talk about that, if we don't have that kind of community, then it's all right. Well, you know, I'm just kind of banging my head against the wall trying to solve this. Uh, and then eventually we'll seek out information, YouTube forums, whatever. And, uh, oh, okay. Let me find a community of people who are doing this kind of thing and share ideas and so on. So whether it's your own local community or some remote community, it's kind of the same thing really. So short answer for all of that is talk to people doing the same kind of stuff. Thank you so much. I, I don't, I mean, if, if, if you want to stick around, I, by all means, I don't want to prematurely cut this off, but at the same time, it is, it is now 502. Oh, yeah. and I, you know. uh, let's see. Yeah, I've got time for maybe one or two more questions. Uh, I mean, really the more time I spend here answering questions, the less time I'm spending doing work I don't want to do right now. So, you know, really it's not the, it's the you know, <laughs> you're not twisting well, my arm to stay. Um, I got time for one or two more questions if anybody's got them. Otherwise, I'll roll out. I'll go hang out with Spider-Man. We'll save the world. <laughs> why, why the choice of background? There's a, just curious. Is there any? 
Oh, um, I don't know. I just think it's cool. Um, gotcha, gotcha. I yeah. figured maybe some CGI like uh, <laughs> interest or something, maybe, but no, that's definitely just. Every yeah, I, I just uh, I I grabbed a whole bunch of them and I cycle through them between uh, between classes. So I might do uh, you know into the Spider Verse or you know hanging out in my Hall of Armor and uh, every now and again I, I feel you know contemplative and I'm just gonna sit here in the the Sanctum, um, throwing a little Star Wars uh, for good measure. Sometimes uh, Rebels, sometimes Imperials, um, you know whatever. Um, hanging out with. Uh, I'm ready. <laughs> or something like that um, yeah all kinds of fun stuff so you know nice. i just mix them up every day and uh, uh students seem to enjoy it because you know i'll start lecture hey what's up everybody and especially in programming too because you know in programming two students are are very new in most cases very new to the university right and so there's there's all kinds of difficulties not in just the course material but also just college life Right. And, uh, you know, being out of the house for the first time or, or you know, being in a class with 500 people and you're like, oh, my God, I'm terrified right now. And, uh, you know, doing little goofy stuff like this. I mean, one, it entertains me. So, you know, that's awesome. Uh, but, uh, you know, two, it gets the students to kind of relax a little bit. And they're like, oh, cool. The, this teacher is a person just like I am. And so I'm maybe a little uh, less terrified or, or nervous or whatever else, even if it's, you know, one one tiny little fraction of a percent puts the student at ease, then uh, great, I'll continue to do that. Um, and really, if it's even zero, I'll still do it because I enjoy it. You know, it's fun to uh, say, hey, here I am hanging out on Tatooine or whatever else. And, uh, you know, so yeah, that's, that's pretty much that. Just Google uh, fun Marvel Zoom backgrounds. And uh, with, with the Marvel ones, there was just a page that had like 12 of them or something like that. I was here, download all of these for your Zoom calls. And I was like, all right, thanks, Marvel. Uh, so, uh, you know, that was that was easy there. And the same thing for Star Wars. Um, that's pretty much it. We, we've got a uh, we've got a single request to see some of the Lego collection that also came up. <laughs> oh, oh, oh. <laughs> it's a little messy right now. A little messy right now. Um, yeah, it's a little messy. I mean, I've got uh, oh, where's no? Actually, I just put him away a moment ago. I have some. Had some. Uh, I, I love the the Clone Wars uh, minifigures. Um, I love minifigures in general. I've probably got like nine thousand minifigures somewhere uh, in the various bins and boxes. But I had some Clone Wars uh, figures hanging out here. Well, here's another guy sitting on my desk. I have a um, uh, giant Ant Man uh, figure here. So you know, a minifigure is about this big. So this is you know Ant Man made out of uh, Lego parts. And, you know, yeah. So there's part of it. There you go. You want to see some of my Lego collection? There you have it. There you go. <laughs> giant man i guess as he as he was in the uh that airport scene from uh, uh which movie was civil that war? uh yes captain america civil war which is definitely not you know quite the same as the civil war in the no. comics uh, uh if, if you've never read that you should definitely read it um you know get get a subscription to marvel unlimited uh for like 10 bucks a month best 10 bucks a month you'll ever spend uh and just read the civil war series uh i haven't read the second one but the first one was really good um you, you covered the entire marvel universe you know the x-men get involved and uh, there's all kinds of crazy stuff going on there but uh the movie was pretty cool but uh, not not even close to the scale of the comics they couldn't possibly do that in a movie right i mean how many characters were there and how many actors would you have to get for all these different roles no way they could do that sort of thing but uh yeah so anyway there's part of my lego collection awesome all right, uh, any other questions? If not, uh, I had a question. Yeah, what's up? Um, so I'm actually not um at UF uh yet. I'm gonna be transferring okay. soon. Um, okay. and I'm gonna be going into the computer science program. Mm -hmm. Um, I was curious if you had any like tips or anything like to kind of prepare before getting into the program. Uh, before getting into the program, um, I don't think so i mean be ready to you know do student stuff um you know study and do work and all that like so what's your what's your college background prior to now if any um so right now i'm working to get my a degree um and then from the a degree i'm gonna transfer over um i mean right now i've been just you know i i've taken ap computer science but um mm -hmm. And right now I'm trying to like on the side, learn C++ and stuff. And, you know, I know some C sharp. Okay. Um, so just trying to get like an understanding before getting into it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, let's see. So just writing a little bit of code here and there can be helpful. Um, you know, trying to, trying to write 
code, especially for like simple problems that you maybe already know how to do in other languages can be useful. Uh, you know, if you, if you write something trivial, like a, I don't know, a magic eight ball program or, or, you know, something simple like that, rock, paper, scissors, whatever. Um, if you can write that in C sharp and then convert that to C++, uh, that can be helpful because then you're focusing on the language itself instead of the problem you're trying to solve. You've already solved the problem. Now you're just translating it to a new language. Uh, so that can be really helpful because if you're trying to write, uh, solve new problems and learn a new language at the same time, uh, that's not always the easiest thing to do. Uh, it's certainly not impossible, but um, you know, I, I always tell students to try and focus on that. If you find it difficult to do the opposite, right? If you find it more difficult to just kind of dive in, all right, I'm gonna write a big massive game in C++, a language I've never used before. All right, well, good luck. Um, but if you've already written that kind of game in C Sharp or whatever else, then it's usually an easier conversion. So I, that could possibly be helpful. Um, so, okay, so you've, you've already, you know, studied stuff before. It's not really new uh, stuff you'll worry about there. Same, same general kind of process. It's a university, uh, you know, courses work basically the same, uh, you know, no, no differences there. Um, but as far as what to do specifically, I don't really think you need to do much. You kind of, I mean, at least in the classes that I teach, uh, and, and I admittedly, I tend to teach introductory level classes, uh, but I try and, and not make too many assumptions about what students can do previously and say, okay, you come in with maybe a certain minimum level experience from like a programming one style course. Uh, but then beyond that, I try and give everything the students need uh, to them in that semester. Um, not all instructors might be like that though. Some instructors might be like, well, I expect you to already know a whole bunch of stuff and yeah, go figure it out. If you don't, please don't ask me any questions. Um, but uh, just be ready to, to learn a lot on your own as well. Uh, because as much as there might be resources for you within a course, uh, the instructor might provide a bunch of stuff and so on, there might not be. And in some cases it really is, all right, you are responsible for getting X accomplished. Go figure it out. And uh, you know, especially when you get to upper level courses that expectation is usually increased uh, pretty significantly. Uh, so if you have that little bit of independent uh, independent discipline, which wait a minute, wait, you're the you're you're the uh, uh, the discipline guy, right, Andrew? Yes, yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> oh. <laughs> God, I'm preaching to the choir here. You're gonna be fine. You're gonna be fine. Uh, you, have, you have the discipline to work on uh, you know, something for, uh, for a gaming project every single day for 300 plus days, uh, you'll be fine. Um, along those lines, start early on any coursework and work on it every day. Don't wait till the last minute. That's probably the biggest piece of advice. Right? <laughs> Don't wait until the last minute. Uh, anybody who has ever been a student of mine in, in here, uh, has heard me say that before. Don't wait until the last minute, uh, start as early as you can. Um, yeah, there's a, just a sea of questions for every project in the last two days. Uh, but meanwhile, in the 12 days prior, right, there's there's just silence. <laughs> and, Everyone doing the, the Minesweeper 80% speed run. <laughs> <laughs> right. For some uh, people, that's a challenge, not a piece of advice. <laughs> that is true. That is true. Uh, now, one of my, along those lines, one of my favorite stories, uh, a, a student waiting to the last minute, uh, when I, for those who have taken programming too, if you remember the image processing project, um, when I, the first semester that I wrote that assignment, which was summer of like 20, I don't know, 2018 or something like that. It was a long time ago, but, um, the, the A student sent me a message on, uh, like a Monday and the deadline was Wednesday because the semester was coming to a close. And so he sent me a message on a Monday saying, Hey, you know, uh, the last week or two of my life has been busy, stressful, whatever. Can I get an extension on this project? And I said, no, it's due on Wednesday because it's the end of the semester, blah, blah, blah. It's also, you know, we've had two weeks to do it already. And he's like, okay, this is 10 or so in the morning. He sends me a message on Slack later in the day, 6, 7 p.m., same student sends me a message and says, hi, Professor Fox, uh, I have to come clean. Uh, the stuff I said earlier about, you know, the last part of my life being busy, whatever, none of that is true. I just procrastinated on this project and have only gotten started today. However, 
once I started, it turns out it wasn't that bad and I'm done now. And uh, so, you know, I don't need an extension at all. I was like, but okay, cool. Uh, sh- uh, all right. Uh, you just, you know, felt a weight on your conscience and you needed to, uh, you needed to come clean, uh, I suppose. But, uh, but the point is he started in one day at, you know, 10, 11 in the morning and then finished it seven or eight hours later. So uh, whenever I get students who are like, please, oh, please, can I get one more day or two more days or whatever? Like that guy did it in one day. And you standard have- operating procedure. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, yeah. Um, there, there's always going to be students that do that though. And as, as a recovering procrastinator, I understand. I understand that. Uh, I, I sometimes fall off the wagon and still uh, do that once in a while in my life, uh, as much as I wish that were not the case. Um, but, you know, it happens. So uh, start early, get your stuff done days before the deadline, and uh, then don't worry about it. So that's that's my advice to you. Thank you so much, Professor Fox. Thank you for coming in and speaking yeah, no with problem. us really. On, I think I speak for all of us when I say it's been a yeah, it's been a, it's been great. Thank you. Yeah, it's been great. So <laughs> well, happy to be here. Useful information. Like happy I'm like glad go I could help everybody. And like crap, yeah, timestamps are like all like the quotable moments. <laughs> like the discipline <laughs> one. The someone's always been better than you. Uh, the procrastination, <laughs> all of that stuff. I'll be on it. <laughs> <laughs> Is it uh is it okay that we, we we typically upload recordings of this to our YouTube channel? But of course that goes with your consent. Uh, is that you know is that all right? Oh god! Oh god! This was recorded. Is, is that okay? Yes. If it's not, then we won't record. No, no, no. We we, we won't upload anything. Uh, you know that's probably fine. I don't think I said anything in there that was bad. Is this being recorded right now? Me contemplating if it's okay to be recorded? <laughs> yeah, but we can I'll, cut I'll be happy out. to cut this part out or we, any we, part we that you would we like. We could upload just the part of you asking if it's okay to be recorded and then cut out the actual <laughs> rest of the content. We've, we've, we've done that before. We had a guest speaker who released information as head of a studio that was technically NDA'd, but he was like the NDA contractor and thus felt comfortable sharing some of it but didn't want it on youtube prior to release and so we gotcha. all you know so like we're, we're very we're more than happy to you know abide by your consent and uh, i got you i got you not. yeah I'm that's sorry fine. For not making that clear no that's uh, that's fine um yeah i don't think i said anything that was terrible didn't uh you know drop a bunch of f-bombs in there or anything certainly like that. not uh, certainly not there's no no you're it all seems PG-13, so uh, yeah, we're fine. We're fine. And uh, if anybody has any issues, be like, I, just, I didn't know it was being recorded. <laughs> edit that part out. Edit the last five seconds out. Right. Uh, you know, plausible I'll be deniability. Take the blame. <laughs> we, we can share with you. Uh, we'll, we'll certainly stay in touch. Um, I know. I know you. You co-hosted Gator Game Jam in the past, right, with Dr. Blanchard. Uh, yeah. 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 Um, and uh, well, last summer was when GDA was really first taking off uh, and it was, it, it had just finished doubling from like a hundred to 250 people. Now we're, uh, we're, we're a couple of days away from being at 700 people at this rate. And uh, we recently, uh, ever since Gator Game Jam, uh, we took some inspiration from that, you know, UF wide game jam, why not Florida wide? We're now doing a, uh, uh, this coming weekend, uh, joint jam, uh, which is going to be with uh, the entire like USF and UCF uh, game development club. And uh, these are, you know, b- big events that that sort of have now even surpassed the scope of Gator Game Jam. So I think like, um, please, uh, well, I mean, it's up to us to reach out. But what I'm saying is I hope we, we can communicate in the future to organize big, cool events because I think you're into sure. game jams and things like that. So yeah, um, yeah, they can be a lot of fun. Uh, depending on, you know, when they are, it may not be able to be there of, of, course, of course if it's something like that but uh, i mean if i can help uh, you know remotely or you know help with some kind of coordination behind the scenes or something like that uh because you know they can definitely be a lot of fun and uh you know there's just a there's a different level of enthusiasm in those uh, you know in that 48 hour oh, period yes. uh that you know amazing things can come out of there and you know we've, we've seen a few over the years that uh, it's like holy crap you guys really came up with that in 48 hours that's that's pretty impressive uh yeah. and in even for the ones that maybe aren't as impressive. Uh, I mean, well, let's face it, you've only got 48 hours. There's only so much you can do, uh, but there's still just a level of, of energy and enthusiasm, which is always fun to see. Uh, so even if, you know, the, the games aren't wildly successful, most of the time the expectation is they won't be because it's a game jam. You're going to just get together and make something in 48 hours and have fun doing it, uh, regardless of what the outcome is. Any 
amazing outcome is really just kind of a bonus. And, uh, you know, we've, we've certainly seen quite a few of those bonuses over the years. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah, but yeah, you can help. Yeah. Awesome. Well, thank you. Thank you again. I mean, I guess yeah. at this point we'll conclude the meeting, but thank you so much. All right. Sounds good. Yeah, Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Have a good day. Week, yeah. Thank, thank you very much. Well. Take care. Good luck with your project. Oh, he's gone. <laughs> 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 All right. Yeah. Awesome. All right. I'll.